Well, you're doing great. This is our fifth session together. This is an important one because it's for those who want a closer friendship with their loved ones, children, mate, friends. I mean, we're going to show you how to take everyday experiences and turn them into bonding sessions where you can actually feel more connected, more emotionally bonded. Or you can create your sessions where you will see how this can be drawing you together in a close-knit friendship. You can do it at work, you can do it at home. It's something you can apply anytime you want. So you can get active in doing it. You don't have to wait passively to become close-knit. Because you know what? All of us from time to time want that closer bond so you can do something about it. Well, that's going to be the first half of this session. We're going to give you a bonus. The second half, another whole session, both of them are shorter, is a way, a method where you can reduce the negative emotions that you don't want anyway. I mean, if I ask you to raise your hand and say, hey, I'm tired of too much anger, hurt feelings, envy, worry, jealousy, even depression. You're tired of those things. Well, if you want to reduce those dragging on us, really, emotions, you can do something about it. I'll show you why we get so stressed. What's the basic underlying cause of these negative emotions so you can recognize it, do something about it, correct it, and see them start to drain out of your life. In fact, you're going to see them replaced with emotions like more love, more rest, be more relaxed. You're going to see it. And you can do something about it, and it's an exciting time, so let's get right into it. Okay, this is one of my favorite sessions because uh, it's really uh, special to uh, our audience to win and their PLC to stay in a comfortable, blue-baby posture. Now, I know what I'm thinking you can do, but there's one thing in specific that we can do that I have found works almost instantly. And the way I found this was doing... Uh, my own research, because see, we were not close as a family when I was growing up, so I didn't want the same kind of family. So I wanted to reverse some of the bad habits that I'd learned naturally and find out what does it take to have the right kind of marriage and family and friendships and so on. So here's part of the way this works. Now, keeping in mind, if we review here for a moment, if we close a person's spirit while we're doing this activity that I will talk about, then it could do harm. It doesn't cause us to be close. So there are a number of other factors that enter in here. But that uh, closed spirit uh, causes us to not be close friends. Open spirit gives us the basis of being able to be really close. But when we do something specific, it's amazing what it does. Here's what happened. I decided to interview couples that I could meet all over the country that seemed to be really in love and their kids were all ages and they seemed to really enjoy mom and dad. So I just started my own research and there's a um, psychologist professor in, in, in our country that does this kind of research specifically, where he interviews families and does surveys all over the nation, and he's come up with six things that make a real loving family. Well, I've taken two of those and just had them uh, for this close-knit thought. But I had already learned this in my own experience, in my own research, and when I saw his research, research I said, hey, this is really confirmed, and it is effective. Here's what happens. I ask all these families, what do you think causes you to be so much in love and so close? And all the families I interviewed said basically the same thing. And when I would get the kids separate, they'd say the same thing. They said this, we do a lot of things together. I didn't know what I was going to hear. I could have heard anything. So I thought, okay, put down. We do a lot of things together. And I kept hearing this over and over again. Then I thought, well, what, what kind of things do you do together? I mean, what, 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 what do you do? Uh, and I kept hearing, I said, if you could pick one activity that you think is the most important, what would that be? Every family, literally, that I talked to said the same thing. Camping. Isn't that amazing? I never would have known that. Never would have guessed it. In fact, how many of you really don't like camping that well? 
Let's see your hands. Okay, see this? A lot of people don't like camping. So I need to relax everyone to let you know that camping, because I've been, I, we did it for 15 years as a family. We don't do it as much anymore, because I feel like we're close enough. Um, <laughs> but we did it for 15 years, so that gives me some authority to say, after 15 years, that camping is not the secret, okay? <laughs> it's what takes place in camping that is. But it doesn't have to be camping to get it. But I'll show you what I mean. Our very first camping experience, we went to um, uh, Florida from Chicago in a, rent, a rented, borrowed uh, uh, pop-up, you know, one of those things, metal box, you know, and the tent pops out of it kind of thing. First night out in Kentucky. We were so excited. Here we are as a family, you know. This is great, isn't it? You know, fire, you know, and all this stuff, okay? Hey, we got into bed, little tiny, big, long bed, just one bed. And a um, little tiny divider. I mean, so we were with the kids, and they were sound asleep, and we're holding hands, and it got romantic. The wind started, you know, you know kind of like Hawaii, you know, okay? And then pitter-patter, and I thought, hey, is this great? And then wham, the storm hit, and the water came in at such volume, it was, you know, leaking through the, and the wind was whipping us all over the place, you know, and, and, uh, and the, and the, but the worst part of the whole thing was that the lightning was striking all around us. You know, and it wasn't a delay. Usually, you know, you can hear, you know, and then pretty, no, you see it and then you hear it. No, at the same time, big pine trees, you know, frozen. About halfway through, it went for one hour. About halfway through, we're holding hands. Norma says, do you think we're going to blow over? I said, no, not a chance. I thought we were going to blow up, not over. I thought, this is it. We're dead. We're history. We're not going to make it through this. We're going to be flooded out. Or This is a metal box we're in. <laughs> Boom. Okay. Like a laser. Well, we made it through that. We went to other places. We went to the beach, you know, and we, we got down there, and we almost lost Greg. He almost fell into the, off a pier because he had no fear at all. You know, just, <laughs> and uh, I split my lip trying to surf, you know, and, and uh I didn't know where to go, so I made my own little butterfly kind of thing, you know, a lot of pain, and Norma thought everything was funny that night, of course. <laughs> and uh, so we finally go home. I mean, disastrous things kept happening to us, and I kept thinking, and so did she, but we didn't discuss it. Is this really the secret of a close knit? I mean, you got to do this to be close knit kind of thing, you know? Well, we've done it, I mean, literally for, for um, years now, but it is, you don't have to camp to get this. Now, I'm not going to tell you the secret yet because I want to show you how you don't have to camp to get it. You can have in your home. About three years ago or so, Norma comes to me and says, what do you want for Christmas? You know, it's like November, and I hadn't thought about Christmas yet, and so I thought, I don't know. And I'm a short-distance runner, and I like to run two to three miles, this kind of thing, every day. And so I said, I know what I'd like to have. It's one of those things you strap on your ankles, you know, and they have metal bars on them, and you hang upside down, you no know, hooks on them. Or you can get the kind you, you know, lie on, you know, and then you can just put your arms back and you just turn upside down. And so your legs are stretching, your back stretching. And I've tried them in sports places before. I thought, I'll try this. So I said, well, it's pretty expensive, so I don't want to get something I don't use. You know, you know all that stuff. You sell it in a garage sale for one fraction of what you pay for it. So anyway, I want to try it out. So I took an old pair of boots. Norma was gone one day, which was, turned out to be a good thing. I took an old pair of uh, hiking boots, and I drilled holes in the heels, and I bolted two big metal hooks on the heels. And, uh, I mean, I did this. I know it's hard to believe, but I didn't want to just spend this. Well. So I went out in the garage, and I had a chin-up bar for the boys. And the kids were in the house somewhere, and I just figured I'll try it. So I got my stepladder up, and I got one leg up and clunk, you know, and the other leg clunk, you know, kind of thing. And I went down the stepladder, and I'm hanging upside down. Um, my fingers are just touching the cement floor in the garage. And I'm feeling my muscles stretch. I'm thinking, hey, this is nice. I like this. And I'm there quite a while. And, uh, and there is a history of heart failure in my family, you know, kind of thing. And so... I start thinking, I better get down, you know, because I don't want my face started to get hot, you know, and I knew the blood was all going to my head, so I thought, I better get down. So, but, but I stayed up too long. I can't get down. I'm trying to get my strength to put my leg up, and the hooks are too long, and I'm, I'm doing everything I can, and I can't. And I panic, and I think, uh-oh, I'm in big trouble. Can you imagine we have a garage door opener, and Norma's going to come home in a few moments and open the garage door. I'm going to be dead. Hanging upside down, I committed suicide, she'll think. Weird way to do it, but... So I panic, see, so I scream for the kids. Of course, who comes to the door first? The co family comedian, Greg. <laughs> see? And uh, he looks at me and falls on the ground and roars with laughter. He's beating the ground. He goes, Dad, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. What are you doing? And I says, Greg, get off the floor and get me down. I'm dying up here. 
He can't get me off because he's laughing too hard. He's too weak. So we, he, we get the other two. Of course, they're mad at him when they come out because he hasn't helped me. And I'm screaming at all of them now. Now they're all tense. And I'm tense because I'm thinking it's stroke time any moment now. They can't get me off. I mean, literally, they cannot get me off. And so I'm screaming at Carrie to untie my shoelaces. They're too tight because it's been jammed up against her, you know. So I say, go get the scissors. And she can't find the scissors. She finally finds it. She comes out of the garage. She cuts my shoelaces out. I fall out of the shoes. They never occurred to them to move the stepladder. It's aluminum. Cuts my leg real bad. Big gash in my leg. Okay, I splatter against the cement floor, and they, and they scatter. I can't find them because they know they're in big trouble. Now, that's a traumatic experience. That's a crisis, right? Now, I'm not camping, right? Anyone that lives in a home with people can go through stuff like that. I mean, maybe not that weird, but you know, you can, right? Now, what is the secret of close-knitness? It's true with families. You can get an office group to be closer. You can get any group you're involved in closer. The secret is shared crises together some kind of conflict from an outside force. It's struggling against an enemy. See, we were struggling. Anytime you camp, you can get your group to go to camps all over the country that are organized, go up there. If the food's not good, that's great because that draws you closer together later on. Now, the bonding doesn't take place while you're in the middle of the crisis. That's the glue that's applied, slow drying glue. It takes about three weeks for the glue to dry. And then all of a sudden, you're laughing and slapping each other on the back. Was that a scream? But during the time, nobody's laughing. <laughs> it's like the time we were skiing up in the mountains of California. And I get to the top, 11,000 feet. And I'm with Greg at the end of all things. And uh, the other two are somewhere. And I get stomach cramps. I don't know if the altitude or what it is, but I'm really cramping up. And so I say, Greg, you know, and I'm bending over. I said, I got really bad cramps. I, we're going to have to go down. Because I didn't want the corresponding problem that you can have with cramps. And... Uh, <laughs> So I said, let's get going. So we're going down about halfway down. I'm cramping up so bad. I, I slide over to the edge of the mountain and I say, Greg, I'm really in big trouble. And so I take my skis off and I have the corresponding problem. And of course now it's cold out and snowing and everything else. So you have all this stuff on. <laughs> and Greg thinks it's a scream. <laughs> She's slapping the snow again, of course. And I, I, I go into the woods, you know, to help myself. And uh, I literally slip and fall and I slide into the woods. So I'm in big trouble. So I finally get up, you know, nobody wants to stand near me. And, uh, and Greg says, I can hardly wait to tell everybody when we get back to the game. Now, do you think I'm close-knit with my son during that time? No. I want to strangle him. I want to say, you know, do you say anything at all? You know, kind of thing. Nobody feels close-knit during those times. The bonding doesn't take place then. The bonding takes place later on. See, that's part of the whole secret. I used to work with uh, young people, high school and college age, all the time. We took, a, we took a trip to Canada one time. One of, the kid, one of the kids sliced the bottom of his foot after we'd canoed and portage and everything else in this gorgeous water in Canada. Well, we had to go. And everybody was upset with him. He's goofing around anyway kind of thing. So we're on our way back. It's late at night. I'm sleepy. We're in a van. I've got six teenagers in the car. You know, that, that could be trauma all by itself, right? You get close-knit later on just from that, if nothing else. I'm starting to doze off, and I'm driving. It's probably 2 in the morning. I'm dozing a little bit, but I'm, I'm hanging in there. He sees my head bobbing. He doesn't say anything to me, so he whacks me on the back of the neck. <laughs> Wham! Almost whiplash, you know, and I went, hey! You know, I said, hey, who did that? And he says, well, you were falling off, you know. And, uh, and I says, hey, you don't slap me in the back of the neck. You know, okay? So I, I pull into a, to a, a restaurant, you know, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and we eat, and I notice something. I noticed that he put several things of jelly in his pocket. <laughs> and I just happened to see it, you know. And then I noticed him sitting right behind me in the rearview mirror, and I noticed him dozing off. And I noticed he wants to lay down. He's kind of leaned against one of the other kids. And I think, wouldn't it be great? <laughs> and I say, I want to try it. So I slam on the brakes in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night. He flies against the seat and hits the ground, belly down, <laughs> smashes the jelly all over his body. I go, hey. Okay. Now, you think he liked me? No. <laughs> but guess what? Three weeks were tight. <laughs> In fact, I saw him, and this has got to be 15, 20 years ago. I saw him just a couple of months ago up in Minnesota. 
hey, we are so, even to this day, some of the college kids that I worked with back then, now they're doctors and lawyers and things, we're still close because we shared common crises together. Now, you can do that with your family. You can just throw all the kids in the stage wagon and drive around for a couple hours until chaos breaks out. <laughs> and then you uh, go home and you're bonded later on. But don't try to be bonded during the time. It's like the time that, that, that Mike, uh, 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 we were camping again, see? And uh, uh, Greg and I were somewhere, and Mike was up this tree, and he falls about 10 feet up the tree. And before he hits the ground, he straddles a limb. Oh. Now, for boys, that's right. <laughs> uh, that's different than awe. Oh. Okay? That's right. Similar because he is important. Now, boys uh, uh, going to hyperspace, you know, with that kind of thing. So, and I'm not around, so I finally come home and he's in big pain. Mom's been trying to help him. And so I say, We got to get you a doctor. He cut himself real bad. So we're in the middle of the mountains and uh, we drive and I find this little clinic out in the nowhere. Guess who the doctor was on duty? A female. And so Mike goes, Dad, I can't do this. I can't do this. And he says, Please don't let her look at me. I said, Mike, I don't have any choice. It's the only doctor around. So she looks at him, he's mortified, you know, he's like, it's like, okay, she does what she can, you know, because we were too long in getting him in, I guess, and uh, tells me how to doctor him, and he doesn't like that either, kind of thing. But anyway, we come back to camp, and nobody's, everybody's uptight, and that's what usually happens in the middle of a crisis. So we, no one feels like cooking dinner or anything, so let's go out to eat, okay? So we find a place, it's kind of like a poke and plum town in the middle of the mountains, you know what poke and plum town is? You poke your head out the window and you're plum out of town, and because uh, <laughs> all there was really was a, just a little town. Anyway. So, now watch the timing. This is what I love about camping. It's the timing of life. This is what I love about families and close knitness. Watch this. Picture this in your mind. Mike's in tremendous pain, okay? He's in the back seat, four door car. He's trying to get out of the car, right? Okay? He's going, uh, uh, uh. He grabs the door. You think Carrie's watching? No. She's hungry. Wham! And she locks the door. So he's crying from this and he's crying from this. He's screaming in this little town. In fact, really, it's the top of his lungs. Okay. Of course, I have to unlock the door first with a key and get his hand out, you know, and I had to put it in ice and everything. And he, the whole experience was so traumatic. That. So now what do we have? Well, now we have a close knit family. <laughs> uh, Mike's not real happy with Carrie for, for, for several hours. They don't speak to each other, as a matter of fact, for a while, right? But now that I know that this brings bonding, we just sort of endure that part of the experience and then know later on it's going to happen. In fact, the next time you take a trip, if nothing goes wrong, you can go, maybe next time. <laughs> See, because the more things that actually go on, now you don't have to string. Now, here, here's this, this is the reason I have this. This is brand new. But the reason we have this is because this is one of the guaranteed all-time best close-knit experiences. <laughs> now, you have to get, to get your whole family in this. In fact, if you get your whole family in this, you're going to be close-knit, but you need a bigger one, you know, kind of thing, obviously. Well, where, where can we do it in this state? Grand Canyon. Swimming pool. That's true. You could do this in a swimming pool and uh, hope that something goes wrong. But what you do, anytime you take a canoe trip or raft trip or those kinds of things, the great thing about this is something always goes wrong. It's the one with the food that tips upside down, you know. It's the one with the sleeping bag and you all night in a wet sleeping bag. That's awesome stuff. <laughs> and while it's happening, think, boy, this is horrible. But just think what it's doing to us. The bigger the mosquitoes, the better. <laughs> See? Forget the main ingredient on a picnic. That's super. Everybody maybe is upset, so what? Because later on is when you're bonded. Now, how do you actually, or how do we say, how do we accomplish this? Here are the two things that I suggest that families do or friends do, businesses do, whatever you need to do to have this experience. Hey, our business is getting into sports like baseball, you know, different challenging golf and, uh, you know, bowling and all kinds of things. Things go wrong in that all the time. Somebody drops a bowling ball in his foot, you know, kind of thing, and everybody laughs, kind of thing. And uh, there's always a comedian that'll laugh about something like that. And it's nobody's happy during that time. Maybe you lose against your team, but that's bonding. And employment is finding that truer all the time. Here's what I suggest you do. You get the whole family together, kids or no kids or single parent, whatever we have here, and you say, what would be our most enjoyable activity that we can think of in life? List two or three of them. Each person lists their own. Zero to 10, 10 being the most enjoyable. What's a 10 to you? And everybody puts them down. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Norma will say her 10 is uh, a place where there are cute beaches and cute shops and cute restaurants. She loves stuff like that. So, uh, and Carrie's similar, you know, kind of thing. And uh, lo Norma loves to go and sit on a beach and just watch people all day long, kind of thing. You know, that's not my 10. Uh, my 10 is scuba diving and 
and uh, snorkeling and fishing and hiking and adventurous things. Uh, you know, I don't hang glide and stuff like that, but hang gliding obviously would certainly bring you close knit in a hurry. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't want it to be so dangerous that we lose our lives uh, kind of thing, but enough so there's that potential is there. Then here's what we do. The second, the sec this is true. The second thing is that you want to um, combine everybody's 10 or most enjoyable experience into one activity so that everybody knows ahead of time that they're going to get their 10 at some point during the day. Now, I'll give you an example how we do this. Catalina Island, for our family, is a 10. It's uh, relatively inexpensive. It's right off the coast of California. It's close to our home. We just jump on that boat, go over there, and we love it because it has everything. It's crystal clear water and all that stuff. In fact, I should be working for the Chamber of Commerce over there. But uh, anyway, it's an outstanding place, okay? But that's our 10. It might be somebody else's may not be their 10 at all. Your 10 may be living off the land uh, for two weeks in the mountains somewhere, eating bugs and different things, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Everybody's, it's interesting. And, and you might, if, let's say the husband wants to go off in the mountains somewhere and just live off of catching fish and, and uh, eating over a fire kind of thing, cooking your food like that, but away from everything. There's no malls in the area, you know, and stuff like that. Well, how would you combine that? It is possible to camp in various places in Colorado where you're only a mile away from a mall. But you, and you, although you feel like you're, you know, because see, if everybody doesn't have their tin involved, it can really be a downer for the whole family. And that closes the spirit, which drives us apart instead of together. So everyone needs to be valued. And that's why we include everyone in our conversation. So let's do this. We're going to spend 60 seconds and have you turn to your mate or to your friend near you and say, what's your most enjoyable ex experience? And see if you can combine your two enjoyable experiences into one activity. Then I'll ask for different volunteers to raise your hand and give us what yours is. And we'll show you how common we are, uh, how similar we are. Okay? So on your mark, get set, go. <laughs> All right, let's hear yours. Go ahead and stand up and, and uh, share that. Um, a family cruise. Okay, now, so that your enjoyable things would be what? Well, um, the, the confinement and the, and the getaway of a ship. Okay. And, and, then, and then the shopping and the beaches that we would visit. Super. Exactly it. So you put everybody's tin in and everybody can think of it when they're planning it. Thank you. Anyone else? Right down here, we have some. Yes. Ours, ours would be a bike trip in uh, Vermont. For me, the physical activity of riding the bike, my wife, the uh, the uh, scenery, the the feeling of being in New England. Okay. And okay. All right. And now that you have to get see some things you have to get ready for. Otherwise, uh, uh, four hours into the bike trip, uh, he's saying, "Isn't this great?" And she may be saying, "Uh." Now what do we do that she's in tremendous pain? And, but now remember, the pain brings gain. <laughs> okay, right down here in the front. Ours would be a uh, trip to San Diego because we both love the beach, and my wife loves to shop, and I love to play golf, so I can golf while she shops. I got it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, that last session was one of my favorites uh, because it really is what uh, we have been doing for years and years. And, and, and again, I didn't say, but we actually stopped camping about two years ago because I did feel we were close enough. And uh, we didn't need to keep doing that. There's so many other things like hanging upside down that happen naturally. So, so what we have so far then in review here is we have the thing that I believe is the most important factor and that is that we <gasps> one another. And then that leads to building a relationship that takes some very special ingredients for things like uh, growing a plant. Then 
We want to make sure that we are aware of one another and how we can close one another's spirit. And then we talked about um, the importance of uh, being close-knit and the communication method that, that allows us to say basically whatever we want. So this session is a session that also uh, fires me up because it can literally change a person's life right on the spot. And some of you basically may never be the same because so many people want to be happy and want to be fulfilled and want joy in their life and so on. And they're not happy because they are choosing to be unhappy. Do you realize, have you ever had anybody say to you or have you ever been aware of that if you're not happy, if you're miserable, if you are worrying or fearful or angry or hurt, lonely, any of those emotions that you're actually choosing to be that way, that other people or circumstances are not making you that way, although we tend to blame other people and things, they have nothing to do with it. We're choosing it. And, it's, and, and when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, I don't even want to hear this. That means I can't blame these other people for my unhappiness kind of thing because we actually have to assume full responsibility for where we are. In fact, how many of you would love to come to the place where you didn't get your feelings hurt anymore, basically? Let me see your hands, okay? Is that all of us or what? Um, how many of you have been angry at least one time in the last month? Let's see, okay? Are we all alike? Yes. I still get angry from time to time, but it's so cut down so far that, that uh, basically it takes a lot more to make me angry today. And when I do get angry, I know what caused it. I know how to solve it instantly so it doesn't remain, but just moments at times. That's why I would love other people to be. I worry very seldom. I never fear. And I used to fear all the time. Remember I said I'm the last of six kids in the home we were raised in? Well, I had an older brother, four years older than me, who um, used to terrorize me as a kid, literally. I mean, he... I remember I, I, I was telling you it was kind of loose around our home and no rules. And I told you I started my formal dating in the third grade. I did a lot of informal dating up to that point. But uh, my formal dating then, well, what happened is that I'd come home from a date in the third grade or fourth grade or whatever, and he'd be under the bed, maybe with a friend or something. I'd turn the lights off, get in my bed, and he would grab me and pull me under the bed, you know, and, and terrorize me and tell me he's going to kill me and stuff like that, you know. Well, I mean, I love him today because we're real close knit, but the problem is, <laughs> is that that produced some real fear in my life as I was growing up. And so when I was 25 years old, I could not stay in a home alone. I wouldn't admit it to anyone, but I was one of those kind of guys that would get up and check under the bed, check the closet. I'd hear things in the middle of the night. I hated taking a shower with both eyes closed. Have you ever tried to wash your hair with one eye open? It's really hard to do. But I was so full of fear, I don't, that doesn't happen anymore. Gone. Because I finally assumed full responsibility for my fear and for my worry and for my anger and for my hurt. People don't make me angry. They reveal something about me. They don't hurt my feelings. They tell me something very special about myself. Did you hear about the guy who, who wouldn't get up for church one day? His wife was so disgusted. She said, this, here, here we are again, late again, and here you are sleeping in. Would you please get up so we'll be some you know, degree on time? He says, read my lips. I'm not going to church anymore. And she said, oh, this is ridiculous, George. Come on. He said, no, I am not going. And she said, just give me two good reasons why you don't want to go now. He said, well, I've been lying here thinking about it. Number one, I don't like those people down there at that church. And number two, the more I think about it, I don't feel like they like me. So I, why, why, why bother? I, I don't feel comfortable. I don't want to go. She said, oh, George is so ridiculous. He said, well, if you think it's such a hot idea, you give me two good reasons why I ought to go. She said, George, you know, first of all, how good it is for you. And second, George, you're the pastor. <laughs> now, here's a guy who's really messed with, all right? Emotionally, you know, feels people rejected him, feels hurt. He's angry, you know, he's not going to get going down there, okay? Well, all of us, that happens with all of us. That happens at work with our employees, our bosses, at school, with teachers and our studies. I mean, all of us basically go through the normal emotions of anger, hurt, fear, worry, jealousy, all those things. Hey, most of those things are out of my life. We're exactly where I want them, out of my life. Because I'm, if, we, if you have your choice, we'd rather be happy or miserable. Let me see. How many like to be happy, okay? All right, now how many want to be miserable? See, most people want to be happier. That's all of us. So what do we do about it? How do we understand? I want to show you something that really has fascinated me, and it's really kind of a picture of who we are. I'm going to say that lit up, and the lit up condition, we'll say, is a happy person. 
person that feels love and and uh, is happy inside and and uh, you know has peace of heart and mind. I'd say I'm a happy person, and it's not dependent upon what's going on around. It's just the way they are right now. We're all a little bit like this light bulb, in a sense. We all have a cord, you know, and we all have a plug that we want to start looking around and who we're going to plug into, kind of thing. So, what we tend to do is we tend to plug our life into one of three or all three sources. And the problem is, and I'll tell you ahead of time, when we do this, it's a big mistake, and I'll show you why. But we all tend to do it. And I still tend to do it. I'm still tempted to do it. And I know I'm doing it instantly when I'm angry, hurt, fearful, worried, and all that kind of stuff. Here's how it works. We first take our cord and we look for a person. People is the first source. We say, if I could just find Mr. Wonderful or Miss Wonderful, and if I could just meet that person and get engaged and get married, boy, wouldn't life be great? I'd be so lit up. I'd be happy. You know, he'd be holding me and talking with me and be romantic and all that stuff. And then a woman marries. And all of a sudden, after a few months or years, it doesn't happen. He's not making her happy. In fact, what he's doing is he's draining what little energy she had. And it panics a lot of women. They think, wait a minute, I, can't, I don't know about this. This didn't seem to be making me happy. And the problem is, almost 100% of the problem is that she is expecting Mr. Wonderful to light her light. She wants him to make her happy. She's looking for it. Now, some of them think to themselves, oh, I should have thought about this a long time ago. It's not husbands that make you happy. It's little kids running around the house. That's what makes you really happy. So then you get little kids running around the house. And you know what they're capable of doing? They're capable of short-circuiting your whole system. <laughs> Depends on the temperament of your kid, of course. But so it's what about a friend or, 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 or what, what, what about, I mean, in fact, the second area that people tend to plug into is places. Like, where are you going to live, and does it have a view, and is it nice enough, and, and uh, you know, do people really go, oh, when they look at your house, you know, kind of thing. Some people literally think you'll never be lit up and never be happy and fulfilled and really, you know, encouraged with life until you get the right home. Some people work their heads off and save and go into debt and everything else to get that home. Then they get it, and they find out, you know, this isn't doing it. This doesn't have it. Some people say, oh, well, I know what it is, the mountain cabin. And I've found that you can argue and be unhappy in a mountain cabin just as easy as you can in your own home. It doesn't seem like mountain cabins do it. They do it for a while until, they'll, until it wears off and the newness is off. It's like a new car kind of thing. I remember the time that um, Norma had dreamed all her life to go to Hawaii. And finally, an organization invited me to speak in Hawaii. And it was Kauai, actually. And it sounded even more romantic. She said, hey, you know, kind of thing. So we planned to go. And we took Carrie, our daughter. And so we show up in Kauai, and there's no lay. They didn't put a layer on her neck. And she'd expected all her life that when you get in Hawaii, you get a lay. And it was, she was almost depressed. You know, kind of, I was trying to encourage her. That's okay. We'll find one somewhere else. It's not the same. You know, <laughs> you know kind of thing. So I thought, well, hey, it's going to get better. Well, it wasn't better because we were, we were doing our conference on the north side of Kauai. It rains 425 inches a year there. It rained every day, all day long, we were there. So we had to get in a car and drive to the south part or the west part just to see the sun kind of thing. It's kind of like a whole world, all this stuff, this Grand Canyon and everything else. But the north side just happens to be real wet. Well, that depressed her and discouraged and everything else. Well, guess what else she had really dreamed about? The luau. Oh, she had dreamed about that luau. You know, we talked about the luau. Well, it was Thursday evening at about 8 o'clock or so. And so I was bored, you know. We'd done everything I could think to do in that place. And so and I'm conquer-oriented and thinking, we can't just sit around here. And she was enjoying getting ready and thinking about what she was going to wear and all these things, you know. And, of course, we had purchased the lay for the evening and everything else. And... Uh, and she was all excited about it. I said, hey, why don't we go on a drive? Because I know she loves to tour around. And she says, yeah, that's a great idea. I says, good. Okay, now later on in our parenting uh, seminar, I'm going to talk about different temperaments. And I have to have this kind of temperament that gets all excited about ideas, you know, kind of thing. And, but I don't always think of every detail that goes into the idea. So we get in the car and we drive. And we get a long ways away from the luau because we're loving it. All of a sudden, I look at the gas gauge. There's no gas. We're in empty, totally unempty. And I don't know what to say, so I pull and I turn around and I'm going back and I'm being real cautious and I'm, and I'm trying to, and she says, what's wrong? And I said, nothing, nothing's all wrong. <laughs> and she says, well, something's wrong. It's like another two or three hours, I guess, before the luau. And I said, I, I, everything's fine. And we're going along. And, and, and so she looks at the gas gauge because you know something's wrong. She says, we're out of gas, aren't we? 
we're out of gas. How could you do this? You know, we're out of gas. And I was, I can't believe I did this. You know, there's no gas station anywhere in sight. You know, kind of thing. So I'm going real slow. I'm going up and down the mountains, real slow, real slow. And I'm so nervous that she's going to miss this thing because I know how special this is to her. And and because I was just trying to think of something nice to do. And and I'm 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 not. I have a Bronco, and at that time it was a shift Bronco, and uh, as a car. And and so we're starting to go down this hill, and I want to shift into neutral so we can save more gas. But we're not in a Bronco. We're in an automatic rent-a-car. So I'm real nervous about this anyway. She's over there like this, you know, just not speaking to me at all and thinking, you know, how could you do this to me? And so I slam on the on the uh, clutch to put it in neutral, but it doesn't have a clutch. It's the brake. And in the middle of the road, I go, and I, and I slam her against the windshield and the dash. And, of course, she's plastered up against the dash thinking I'm trying to kill her, you know. And, uh, and I, I don't even know what happened. I thought I hit something or whatever. I can't figure out what's going on because I'm so nervous about the whole thing, you know. Of course, she's not bleeding or anything. But um, anyway, she is, I mean, then, then of course, we just sit and we laugh. We, we have to howl because we know three weeks from now we'll be bonded. But uh, <laughs> anyway, hey, you can go to a place like Hawaii and have total disaster. You can dream and expect that Hawaii is going to be your real key to happiness. And it can be just the opposite. It can be disaster. And if you don't get happy in Hawaii, it has nothing to do with the rain. Nothing to do with missing or attending the luau. It has everything to do with the attitude that we have. And part of the attitude is that we're expecting Hawaii to light our light. Now, what's the third thing we tend to plug into? We tend to plug into things. So it's just a noun. People, place, and things. You'll remember that. And when we plug into it, we're in big trouble. What do a lot of people plug into things? One of the top things is what? Jobs. We think, if I could just get the right job, if I could get a different job, another job, or just get a job, period. <laughs> Some people are thinking that. Do you know why most jobs don't ultimately make us happy? Because almost all jobs have at least one thing in common. Work. <laughs> all right? And after a while, what does that do to you? Okay? All right, so we think of it's not that... What about this one? How many people have you heard say this or you've said it to yourself? If I could just get more money, money would do it. Oh, the green stuff, wouldn't that? Hey, how many rich people have I talked to who are miserable? You can't imagine how many of those people can afford to fly in different parts of the country to our office and tell us how unhappy they are. Money does not do it because how much is enough? And what does that open up? And more money opens up mobility which opens up more, doing more things, which stresses us out more. And then you have to invest it, and then you have to save it. And, and I know there are some people here who are saying, I hear what you're saying, Gary, but I just kind of like to try that myself. You know? <laughs> Go ahead, do it. You're going to find the same thing, that money never ultimately makes us happy and satisfies. It doesn't do it. And the reason it doesn't do it is the same problem with the other things is because if you expect money as an end in itself to make you happy, that's the downfall right there. That's the big problem. Is expecting. What about talent? Some of you say, well, I could just be talent, more talented. That would do it. I could go up further in the world and everything else. You start working on all your talent, go back to school and all that stuff. Hey, if your end result is getting more talent, because that's what make you happy, doesn't do it. You're about the woman who said, George, why do you always go out in the front yard every time I, I start my singing lessons? He said, well, honey, I want the neighbors to see me so they, they know I'm not beating you. Now... <laughs> Obviously, she wouldn't be happy after a state like that. Just close her spirit and so on, dishonoring everything else. But now, what is the secret? Here it is. Anytime I can show you, and I'll show you over and over again, and you can see it for yourself. The next time you're angry, the next time you're hurt feelings, the next time you're fearing, the next time you're worrying, the next time you're jealous or envious, lonely, discouraged, even depressed, ask yourself, am I expecting something in this world to fulfill me? Because if the juice is running this way, you set yourself up instantly to be hurt because of your expectations. That's the problem. And the greater your expectations, I mean, basically what we, all of us, we're self-centered. We want other people to make us happy, other things, and we're looking for that. It's normal. It's natural. The only problem is it leads to the wrong emotions. It doesn't lead to happiness. Because any time you start making a focus of letting the juice flow out of your life, what you're really doing is you're loving people. That's the whole basis of being a volunteer, for example. 
the more you have the attitude of what are, pe what are the needs of people around me and what can I do to serve those needs? Because happiness is a byproduct. It is not something you go for. Happiness comes, it slips into your life some secret uh, phenomenal way as you are serving other people. Do you know that the most successful businesses in this world are businesses that learn the secret of serving? You find people's real needs and you produce a product that meets that need and then you service a quality product and you'll be successful. Watch what happens. I just spent some time with the president and founder of Federal Express worldwide and many of us have used that service. And I heard him say that our number one goal is to serve our employees. We want to make sure that they are getting what they need as a person, family, whatever, and they have a no layoff policy because they want to make sure their employees are happy. Then they serve the customer. You have a, you have a happy worker and a happy customer. You've got a successful business because you're a servant. Uh, the same thing is true. In fact, take the Olympics, for example. You don't go after the gold medal. The gold medal is a reflection. It's a byproduct of hard work and dedication, eating right, and knowing the knowledge and the skills of what you need to do in that sport. You don't say, I'm going to go win the gold medal. That's something that is a prize for doing what's right. Happiness is a prize for doing what's right. And what's right is learning to, to notice and be aware of the needs of people around us in our home, our community, in our work, and say to yourself, I'm going to start learning how to meet people's real needs and do a quality job of doing it and watch how successful you'll be in life and watch how happy you're going to be and fulfilled. And watch how you, your, your feelings of uh, anger will be drained away, your feelings of hurt feelings, because if you're not expecting something from another person, they can't hurt your feelings. Just think now, this is awesome. If you come to the place where you're not expecting things from another person, they cannot manipulate you and hurt your feelings. It's impossible. Nor can they make you angry because they're not blocking any of your goals. Your goal is not to get from them. Your goal is to help them. And the more people you help, and this is a secret that's ages old, the more people you help, the more people want to help you. So you're not doing it to get. You're doing it to get a greater capacity to give more. But in the process, people start doing things for you, and you say, wait a minute, I'm not doing this to get something for myself. No, we have to do this for you. No, no, you don't have to do this. I'm just doing it because I want to do it. No, we insist. So they have a whole party and give it to you. And you go, oh, okay. But you already have your happiness because you're doing it for them. Then what do you get? You get overflow. You get so much light, it's unreal. It's exactly what it is. Now, you think of the implications of that. Think of the implications of this concept. The people who usually make us the most upset, who, who try to hurt our feelings, who try to make us angry, who try to do things that cause us to have negative emotions or, or ordinarily cause us to have negative emotions. The people who are doing that are people who are expecting people to make them happy. So that tells you a lot about them right off. So you know where their focus is, what they're plugged into. Probably you if, you're make, if, if they're trying to make you un unhappy. So here's the key to that. When we find somebody trying to make us unhappy, that's pain for us, or a trial. Let's say we're going to experience a trial because somebody's making us unhappy. Here's the secret to that. This is so exciting because one of the great all-time uh, uh, lessons of life is to recognize, and this is a pearl and, and, a, and a this is a oyster, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's a it's a pearl that uh, uh, would be like one that you'd get out one like this is actually the real thing here. Uh, but we want you to be able to see this so we have a little bit bigger one. But this is possible to get them this big. Anyway, what causes the pearl? Irritation. A grain of sand. How many people have at least, how many of you have at least one person that you can think of in life that irritates you? Let's see, okay? <laughs> All right, now, that person or that place or that thing is a little grain of sand or a big grain of sand, whatever it is, and it deposits into your life. Now, you've got a lot of responses you can have. You can say to yourself, oh, I hate that. And you can look for the sand and get it out of your life. Or you can say, you know what? I wonder if a pearl could grow out of this irritation. That's exactly what happens in life. And I'll show you the pearl. You see this pearl here? You know what this pearl really is? 
This pearl is genuine love. Because I'll show you this, and I've never found the exception. Every time you go through a painful experience, a trial, and remember the old saying, uh, no pain, no gain? You can rephrase that. Pain brings gain. Irritation brings genuine love. And I mean, I can assure you this, and if I needed to sit down with, with each one of you one at a time, I could show you that the things that irritate you are literally, while they're irritating you, making you more loving. Now, of course, we don't want to be irritated every day, all day long, the rest of our life, because then you're miserable, you know, during the irritation. So most people only go through a period of irritation because the more you're irritated and the deeper the irritation, it makes you, uh, it's sort of like it increases your tolerance. You're able to take more pain in the future before you really experience it at pain is really what that is. Every time, well, it's just like this. Let's say you've never been to the doctor, and you go to the doctor, he gives you a shot. You go, Ooh, you know. Okay, then the next time you go to the doctor, he has a little surgery. The, the little shot's nothing compared to the surgery. Then the next time they open you up, you know, and you're there for three weeks. Well, a little shot, little little cuts, nothing. See, every time you have an increased pain, you have more tolerance of things that aren't, aren't, aren't any big deal, man. In fact, I'm not even phased by things that would have phased me in my 20s and 30s and early 40s. Because I now know that every, ir every drop of sand that is deposited in my life from one reason or another, it could be a person, a place, or a thing, I now know that that grain of sand causes irritation. It produces genuine love. I'll show you why it does. Instantly you experience pain, immediately the right side of your brain is stimulated. The right side of the brain is where we have our feelings and our emotions. You're going to be more sensitive and more emotionally based as you go through pain. This is what always happens. You're all of a sudden going to be more empathetic. You can feel the pain of other people better because you've experienced pain. You're going to be more understanding. You're going to be a better friend, a better mom, a better dad, a better employee. You show me the boss of a big company who's been through a lot of trials, and I'll show you a more loving boss, if he didn't get angry and stay angry. See, it's one thing to get angry. It's another thing to stay angry. You see, it's really, really hard to stay angry when you realize that irritations are benefiting you. And it's hard for me to do that. I develop a grateful heart. I start saying, wow, this is amazing. This thing is actually helping me. Now, it's not easy to do immediately. Now, <clears throat> what I'm not saying, which is really important, is that I'm not saying we go out and hurt people so they would grow and become more loving. Because that's not honoring. That's not loving people. Even though I do know that something outside of our control, it's possible to become more loving. I do know that. But I'm not saying that, okay, because of that, let's go over and be mean to our kids and be mean to our mate and be mean at work and our employees and everything else. Uh, and so they'll be real, you know, unhappy and miserable. And I'll be a big giant grain of sand in their life. And just think they'll be a big pearl one of these days. See, that's real insensitive, unloving, unkind, uh, borders on, uh, and I'm sure there are people who think this way and could think this way, but it borders on being, you know, uh, neurotic. It's not healthy. Even though I know that for a person, when it happens to me, I can gain a great deal. So what we have is... Part of the secret of happiness and getting out of those emotions is recognizing that happiness comes as a byproduct of getting excited about being in the lives of other people, helping them, volunteering, really, really reaching out to people. And don't look for happiness. It'll come. Second, when we're irritated, we know that irritations and things that make us angry and unhappy and and hurt and fearful and all that stuff, those things can actually make us more loving, which only gives us a better capacity to be able to help people more. Since that's the only thing I know is really the most important thing in life is helping other people, then I know if, if irritations make me better at it, fine. I don't search for it. How many of you people say, oh, I hope today something goes wrong in my life and I get really blasted? Anybody like that? <laughs> Nobody wants that. I don't want it either. But I know that enough comes to my life on its own so I'm going to use the bad things that happen to me for my benefit and for the sake of other people instead of letting it get to me and downing me. You know, this is a tremendous phenomenon, but the higher your level of anger, the more you're going to feel like a victim. The more you feel like a victim, the lower your self-esteem is. You can reverse both of those. The less anger you have and the more you realize you're a loving person, the more self-esteem you have. So the more, less anger, the higher the self-esteem. Do you realize that your self-esteem can go up almost as high as you want it? 
by reaching out to other people and realizing how special you are. And I'll, let me give you an example of this so it really nails it down. I work with a lot of people around the country that, that, are, that are unhappy, really miserable. And one particular time, a pro football player asked if I could talk to his wife. She's a very pretty woman. And, and uh, I don't need to give you her name, her, her, give you her name but uh, she was written up in the sports section of a large city in our country because she shared her story. When I first saw her, she was very unhappy, miserable. She had a little daughter, and she was feeling so bad about the way she was treating her daughter. She said, I'm starting to treat my daughter like my parents treated me, and I hate it so much, and I just it kills me inside to see what's happening to her, and I can't relate to my husband like I want to, and he was saying, yes, what can we do? So what I did with her is I treasure hunted with her. I told her there was a pearl in her life somewhere, and that we'd find it together. We only spent about 10 hours together, all, all, all together. And within six hours, I began to find the pearls in her life. And what I did was I started treasure hunting for her being a very loving person, but she had never seen it before. And I pulled out of her. I said, look how sensitive you are in this area. And look what you can de detect in this area. And look how aware you are over here. And, and finally it came out and just tears streaming down. She said, yes. She said, I could walk down the street of any city in this town, and I can sense whether a girl has been abused either sexually or being abused physically, I can sense it, and I know how to help her. And I said, if you learn what I'm trying to explain to you here, you'll have such pearls in your life, you'll be able to go to those girls and share with them that now that this has happened to them, you can show them how they have their own pearl. And she said, yes, I could be a pearl hunter. I could be a treasure hunter. And guess what she does today? She volunteers in the clinic where there's battered and abused children. And when she goes into the room with those children, they share, my dad did this, or my mom did this, or my uncle did this, and they're weeping, and they're thinking, my life is ruined. Inside her, she knows she has a pearl. She'll listen to it, and she alone can feel it, because she'll say, let me tell you about my life. And they go, you went through that too. How come you're not destroyed? How come you look so happy? And she'll say, I'll tell you why I look happy, because I am inside. Those people didn't rob my happiness. They gave me a pearl, never even knew it, because I found it. And I let it grow because I got the anger out of my life because now I realize I'm more loving than I maybe ever could have been had those things not have happened to me. Now here again, let me caution, you see. We don't do these things to people because that's very unloving, unkind, because we don't know how they're going to respond. If they don't treasure hunt, you can literally ruin a child, ruin an adult. You can have their self-worth so low, they can be so angry inside, their spirit so tightly closed that they want nothing to do with you or anyone else. One of the worst things we can do is leave someone with anger. So you never know whether they're going to respond right. But if it happened to you, you can literally treasure hunt. What kind of parents did you have? Did you have insensitive parents? Did you have abusive parents? What kind of childhood did you have? Did you have something go wrong in your childhood that really, when it comes to your mind, you go, Ooh, I don't even like to think about it because it's so painful. Do you know that that's a pearl growing inside you? And I wish I could sit down with each one of you one at a time and show you how you're more loving as a result of it. But if you don't know it, you don't express it. If you're still angry, it stifles the love. It's like it keeps the... Sh if you stay angry, then it's like the shell is over the pearl and you don't see the pearl. You get rid of your anger and start learning to be grateful for the things that have gone wrong. And all of a sudden, the pearl will show and people will begin to see your love and you'll be more able to help the people around you which byproduct is happiness. And I know and have watched all over this country this very presentation change the lives of people who have been looking to their mate, their children, their job, their home, their car, you name it, to somehow get happiness. It doesn't come there. It comes as a byproduct. Thank you. Well, did you see in the session that uh, doing things together, activities that cause some difficulty, bond us together? I mean, a lot of times we don't like that, but it does bond us. 
And I, I'm sure you've said to yourself, I'm not going to do that again because that was too tough on me. Well, if we drain the anger out, it takes about two or three weeks to do that. That's what bonds us. In fact, our kids can be bonded with their friends. You can be more bonded at work. This is the very thing that we can use on a daily basis to take ordinary things and use them in bonding. But again, the key is making sure that the anger drains out. Well, then did you get in the session about expectations? How too many expectations actually is what causes us to be stressed. Expectations and people and places and things and, and uh, wanting us to be fulfilled, focusing on our needs more than the needs of others. And what happens is, is that we get disappointed, we get angry, hurt, jealous, all those emotions we don't want anyway. And we see a reversal of that, more of the positive emotions of love and real peace inside when we start focusing on their needs and stop expecting so much. Now, we're still going to do that, and we're still going to have expectations, but when we reduce them is when we reduce the stress. Well, in the next video session, I'm excited about it, and I know you're going to say, well, I don't know if that can, how can that really be true? You're going to see instant self-esteem. I don't want you to change a thing. You're going to just be natural. You're going to watch it. I'm going to show you how to pick up your basic personality. You're going to see what you were born with, in fact, what your natural tendencies are. And I'm going to show you how that instantly can make you feel more self-esteem. You're going to see how you fit into a group, into your marriage, at work. I mean, you're going to see this. I'm going to show you how you have more harmony with your family members, you're going to see how to see your children as unique individuals that are going to be treated differently or your friends. Why we do the things we do and grade against each other because of our personality differences. If you don't like something negative about your personality, I'll show you how to take your positive qualities and character qualities and actually change those negative things. You're going to see some super things about how your natural tendencies can be used for your own self-esteem. I'm excited about it, and I can hardly wait for you to see it. So this is a presentation about how do we know what our children are, how do we know who we are, and how do we function together uh, as, as a family. I remember the time where, where and this shows our temperament styles. Norma has a little bit of a different temperament than I do, a little bit different personality than I do. And uh, she has some characteristics that I have, and I have some like she has, but she has one or two that are really different than me. She's much more relational and so on, and we'll get to that. But uh, I'm much more the kind of person that's excited about life, you know, enthusiastic and ideas and so on. And she said to me one time, she said, hey, you want to you wanna go through one of those new drive through zoos? You know, and I said, yeah, hey, great idea. You know, I just thought it'd be a ball driving around, you know, kind of thing. And she, she in her mind, because of her temperament, she had a totally different idea. She wanted to go and actually see the animals, be a little more careful, and, and uh, she's much more uh, cautious than I am. You know, I'm much daring, you know, and I like to get right in there and so on and so forth, and that's not her. She doesn't enjoy that kind of thing, and she wants to just sit and look at the animals and different things and, and uh, really enjoy them, and I just like to zip around, you know, kind of thing. I'm more of a sports car when it comes to going to a, a zoo. You know, she'd be more like a touring bus. Or she just likes to kind of stop now and then and have the speaker say, now let me tell you what this animal is, you know, and so forth. I say, hey, you've seen one of those? You've seen them all. Just move along. <laughs> and you'll see our temperament differences here in a moment. Anyway, we show up at the zoo. We're in a convertible. They said keep the top up. I read the instructions. Great, I'll do it. And it also said if anything happens to your car, just honk your horn and a friendly ranger will come and rescue you. Sounds good to me. So I'm zipping around and, and so on. And we get to the danger section. It says, keep your windows up. There's wild animals, dangerous ones in this section. So we do. Traffic slows down. I'm in this borrowed uh, car, and it overheats. And, uh, of course, I don't even notice it. Norma says, what's coming out from underneath the hood? You know, steam. And I said, oh, no. I looked at Gage, and it said, explode any second. And uh, <laughs> so I pull off the road. She says, you can't pull off here. Keep going. I said, Norma, I can't keep going. This, uh, this car is going to explode. I said, We're, this is not even our car. She said, well, not here. This is where the wild animals are. I said, hey, it's okay. It says right here. It says honk the horn. Friendly ranger, come and rescue. <laughs> Loud horn. So I started honking the horn. I honked the horn for 45 minutes. No friendly ranger ever came and rescued. <laughs> they basically lied uh, in that brochure. <laughs> but during the 45 minutes, all kinds of things happened that showed up our personalities and our temperaments. First thing, the wild burls were eating the top of this convertible. I had to get out and shoo them away. Okay. Now, 
Lots of things happened, but the worst thing that happened was an entire herd of buffalo came out of the woods and surrounded our car, you know, blocking traffic and everything else. One of them on my side, you know, this is the place you feed these things, right? One of them on my side wanders over, and they're humongous. You ever been real close to a buffalo? And uh, it came over to this little sports car, knelt down, pushed its head up against my window. So there's its head right there. I'm looking four inches away from this thing. Huge eyes, you know, big horns, the kind of thing. And it's saying to me, you, you got anything in there for me? You know, and uh, I can't even look at it. So I'm looking away like this. And I say to Norm, is he gone yet? You know, she says, he's still right there. I said, is he? I said, listen to him breathe. She says, that's not him breathing, that's me breathing. <laughs> now, obviously she's freaked out a lot more than I was, you know, kind of thing. So uh, basically all we really did was just held hands and endured the whole thing. And then 45 minutes, anything cools down. So we took off, we were out of there. Kind of thing. Now, that shows up our personality because I tend to want to do things, like I mentioned before, you know, get excited. And that, in fact, that whole thing was a challenge to me. I loved it in some ways because it was exciting, you know, and all that kind of thing. She wasn't big on that. And she doesn't want to do that again, kind of thing. And I'll show you why. And it's the same thing is true with our children. Now, this measurement device that you can take, there's a lot of measurements that um, counselors give and so on that show us how sick we are. This is a measurement device that shows us how well we are and how healthy we are and how special we are to fit into a particular group.